bring her to the stage, ladies and gentlemen. My mother was like a goddess to me. She was a beautiful woman. She was tall, about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and plus size. I used to always refer to her as a 300-pound Coca-Cola bottle. <laughs> My mother was very dainty, very feminine. When I was little, I used to love just watching her on Sunday morning get ready for church, and uh, she very carefully put on her makeup, and she'd comb her hair, and her hair would rest on her shoulders, and then she'd crown her head with her church hat, and then she'd step back from the mirror a little bit, and she'd look at herself, and she saw, she, she just looked like she was finishing a, a, an art piece. And I would look at her as, gee, this woman is my mother, and she's so beautiful. See, my mother was a Mississippi gal. She was born in 1915, and she was definitely a Southern belle. And my mother always taught me all the things necessary to be a good woman, to be a good girl, and to be a lady. Um, she would always, like when I was little, we would always play lady. She would always say, okay, Dolores, she says now, a lady, when she sits, she crosses her feet at the ankles. A lady never lets her back touch the back of a chair because that's slouching. <laughs> a lady, always make sure that she keeps her knees together and her dress down over her knees because you don't want some man looking up your dress in your panties. <laughs> See, I learned at an early age that uh, being a lady was very tied to religion and suppressing your sexuality. And um, we were hardcore, fundamental Christians. We were missionary Baptists. But let me tell you this about my mother, okay? She didn't care. If, you, if she met you and you say you believed in God, she'd send me off to church with you. <laughs> okay, so I would be at Shabbat with Mr. Cross or catechism with Lorraine and Angela at the mosque. I mean, she didn't care. She said, baby, I'm going to send you any way you need to go just so long as you can learn about God. Now, Deuteronomy, <laughs> 22nd chapter, 5th verse, says that a girl or a woman is never to wear clothing pertaining to that of a man, and vice versa. So consequently, I had to play in a dress, all right? So um, that curtailed or, or had a lot to do with what I played and how I played. One day, my brother and I decided we were gonna play uh, cowboys and Indians, and so I decided I was gonna walk bow leg. You know how cowboys walk? And my mother came in the room, she said, girl, if you don't straighten your little self up, up there walking all gap leg like you've been doing something, sit down. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, but uh, doing what? I'm sick. <laughs> there was another time. Um, now, of course, with the dress, you're not allowed to climb because, of course, of the panty thing. And um, <laughs> I was nine, and there was a fence around the schoolyard. And the kids would always climb the fence, and I wanted to try it. So I decided I'm going to climb the fence. And besides, who's going to know, all right? So I climb the fence, and when I get to try to throw my leg over the top, the wires at the top scratched the inside of my upper thigh, went through the seat of my panties, and hung me on the top of that fence. <laughs> so bottom line, I'm trying to get myself off, and I fell. I fell that eight feet and knocked myself out. I don't know how long I was knocked out, but when I came to, here I am, spread eagle, dress over my head, and I realized I ain't got no panties on. <laughs> and when I look up, there are my panties still up there on top of the <laughs> Now, Now, I'm hurt. I really am, I'm hurt, but that was not my problem, okay? My problem was, how was I gonna go home and explain to my mother why I'm all dirty and I'm walking gap leg like I've been doing something, okay? And, you know, I have no defense because I ain't got no panties on. <laughs> so anyway, I get in the house and fortunately, mother was on the phone and uh, I was able to scoop by and, and, and change clothes and everything, but mother was the kind of person, she wouldn't say anything, she would watch you. She would watch me, and she just let her eyes follow me. And then, what, you know, and I never knew what she was thinking or what she would even do. But um, anyway, when she get over, she started talking. When I was 11, um, it was, let's see, it was July of 1964, and I'm sitting on my bed, 
And uh, it was a summer, summer school, uh, school was out rather. So mother, uh, who always carried herself like a lady, came in and she was really different that day. So she comes running in and she, I guess she had run, uh, run some errands and she sits down and she said, Dolores, I met the nicest man today. I'm thinking, huh, that's, that's different. Um, she said, his name is Jimmy Williams, and, and he wants to uh, come by and meet you, and then this evening he says he'll take us out to a movie. Now let me just say this, my parents had, they were married like 50 years, and they had separated after 25 years, but they'd never divorced, so mother always carried daddy's name. She always um, proudly carried her name, and she and rather call herself Mrs. Darnus Lyons, she referred to herself as Mrs. Jessie Lyons. So, and she never seemed to have been interested in anybody, in, in, in anybody. so to have somebody step into our life was really different. So uh, I said, okay. So Jimmy comes over and um, mother um, introduces us and I shake his hand. And um, she said, Jimmy, can you believe she's only 11 years old? And I was a mature looking 11 year old. 11 year old. And she said, you know, and, she's, and, and she's, she's a big girl for her age, isn't she? And he sits back in the chair and he gives me an up and down look that was so uncomfortable. And I couldn't, uh, you know, I just couldn't wait to get out of there. And he said, yeah, he said, she really is pretty. And, I mean, oh, uh, big for her age, and she's pretty too, which my mother took it as a compliment to herself. So anyway, she dismissed me on to, the, um, to my bedroom. He took us out that night. But bottom line, for 18 months, Jimmy sexually molested me. And I didn't know how to tell mother because she, you know, she, she said, she says, you know, she used to tell me things, too, about being a lady. She said, a man will never do or say anything disrespectful to a woman who carries herself like a lady. She always taught me that, okay? So I'm trying to figure out what did I do to cause him to do this to me. I couldn't figure it out. So I was afraid to tell her, and so it went on. One time, though, she did look at me, and she, she um, and I figured she, she had to have known. She says, you know, Dolores, she says, I get the feeling that something's going on between you and Jimmy. But she says, I, I, and I'm thinking, oh boy, I can tell her now. She says, but if I ever find out that anything's going on between you and him, I'll kill you and him both. <laughs> so of course, I'm not gonna tell her now. I dealt with about, I don't know, five or six more months of, of his molesting me. Um, I stay out of his way. One day he'd come over to take her out or whatever, and I went into the bedroom. And uh, I heard a door close, and then the house was quiet. So I just figured, okay, they're gone. So I came out of the bedroom, the house was still. So I was getting ready to cross the living room, and all of a sudden somebody grabs me, and I mean, tongue down my throat, hands everywhere, and it startled me, because I didn't expect anybody in the house, but of course I recognized the familiar, familiar feel of his body. And then we heard the toilet flush, so I figured, Okay, it was her going into the bathroom. That's the door I heard close. So when he heard the toilet flush, he pushed me away. And when he pushed me away, I mean, I came back with, I mean, I beat, I, I'm, and I said, don't you ever touch me again. Don't you ever touch me again. I said, if you touch me again, I'll kill you. And mother comes out of the bathroom. She said, you crazy girl, what's wrong with you? And I'm just, I'm over her. I'm, I'm going at him, right? I'm beating, I'm beating. And so all the time he's saying, oh, darn us, darn us. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, uh, 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 I got something to tell you. I, something I've been trying to tell you for a long time. So mother picks me up over her shoulder and she slams me on my bed in my bedroom. She says, I'll deal with you when I get back like that. And I'm thinking, I don't care. You, you better not ever touch me again. Mother comes home about three or four years. Uh, hours later, and um, she didn't say anything. She was just dead quiet. And she watched me go back and forth to the living room. And when I say she didn't say anything, I mean, she didn't tell me to get up, go to bed. She didn't say, um, she didn't say anything. Um, I said, I tried to break the ice, and I said, hi, mom. And mother turned her head. First, she looked at me just up and down with such disdain. And uh, she turned her head, she didn't say anything. So on the eighth day, I'm going across the living room. She turned to me, she said, yeah, he told me what you've been doing. And I said, what? And she said, Jimmy told me that the whole time he and I have been seeing each other, that you've been coming on to him. And I, tried, and I started saying, I said, well, that's not true. She says, if, if, girl, don't you say nothing. She said, he told me that 
You got upset with him. He's been trying to push you off, and he didn't want to tell me because he didn't want to upset me. But he said you got upset with him because he may try to make you stop, and that's why you went off on him. And I'm trying to say, Mother, that is so not true. And she said, you know what? She said, if you say another word, she said, I'm going to slap your face. And so it hurt me. And, I, and she said, I want you to go in your room, and don't you say nothing to me, you little strumpet. That, that hurt me so badly. The fact that she wouldn't let me explain or say anything to her. And that's the day I lost my mother. My mother, she just, she quit participating in my life. She did what she had to do. I mean, you know, she fed me, she sent me to school, but she didn't, she didn't come to my high school graduation. She did not, when I went away to college, she said, huh, she said, don't expect another dime from me. And she didn't. Um, I went on to become a um, social worker. She said nothing. I transitioned out of social work into broadcasting, and if my stories came on TV, she'd flick it off. Um, 24 years, for 24 years, I tried my best to let my mother know that I was a good girl. I was trying to do all those things that she had taught me. And, and you know, so I had moved down to Miami, and I'd become a news reporter down there. And, um, I was missing my mother, you know. We, she, she, and then also when we talked, she, she never was nice to me, but I was trying anyway. So I called her, and she, the nastiest she could be, she was. And I said, you know what, mother? I said, for all these years, I said, I've tried to show you and prove to you that I am this, this lady that you raised and that I was doing everything or trying to do everything that you instilled to me. I said, but you know what? I said, I don't deserve that. And I said, I just won't be calling you anymore. And she said, fine, like she was relieved. I had no idea that that would be the last year of my mother's life. Um, I got a call several months later and the doctor said that my mother was in the hospital in intensive care and in a coma. And if I wanted to see her alive, I needed to get up there, uh, you know, come up here immediately. So I did. I jumped on a plane and came up. And um, when I got into the hospital, sure enough, she was in a coma. So I decided to spend the night at the hospital and I pulled a chair up next to her bed and I laid my head next to her bed. The next morning, I woke up with someone stroking my hair and rubbing my face. And when I looked up, it was mother. So she was very weak, and she was just stroking my hair. I said, mother, I said, you're awake. And she says, yeah. She says, happy birthday. And sure enough, it was my birthday. And I said, so how did you know? She says, I know. I said, so do I always have to hear how I you know, was a difficult birth and tore you? And she says, no, no, no. She says, you know what? She says, you were a good girl. And I said, really? And I said, so, I said, mother, how come you never said that before? She says, well, I'm telling you now. She said, you were a good girl. And, and I'm so proud of you. And I said, wow, mother, I said, I need to hear that. I said, so mother, what are you gonna do? I said, are you going to stay on this side? Or are you gonna cross over? She, she, looked, she looked out the window. She says, no, no. She said, I think I'm, a, I'm gonna go. She says, I'm tired, I'm real tired. So she didn't say anything after that. She eventually drifted back to sleep and went back into her coma. And she died about three weeks after that. That was 26 years ago that happened. And over these 26 years, I've had to really do hard psycho spiritual work to work through the effects of sexual abuse and to work through not believing, being believed rather, by the person that you trust the most. Um, I've had to do a lot of forgiveness work. But here's what I've come to. My mother was monumental in my life because she did her best. And we all try to do our best. We're not perfect mothers. We're not perfect human beings. And my mother laid this foundation, and she poured all that she had into this foundation to teach me and make me the person that I am today. And for that, I am honestly grateful that Darnas Harvey Lyons is my mother. Thank you. Dolores Lyons. Yes. Journey to forgiveness, isn't it?